In this next section, we're going to continue to discuss uh, descriptive approaches to design series analysis. Uh, and we're going to now dive into the concept of autocorrelation a bit deeper than we did in our first lecture on uh, descriptive uh, time series approaches where we defined autocorrelation. I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper here. Uh, so autocovariance is, again, the covariance between a time series and itself uh, often is a function of uh, some lag. So in our in this idea of second order stationarity, which is a key assumption for classical time series model, this is really based on, again, the, the first assumption that there is no trend, that the trend's been removed. And the second is that uh, the covariance is just a function of lag rather than a function of where you are in a time series. So the, the variance is constant through time. It's homo scedastic. It's not varying through time. It is just varying. Uh, the covariance is varying as a function of uh, lag. So the you know, typical assumption being, the typical pattern we see is that the things are going, that are close together are much more autocorrelated. And as you move farther apart, that autocorrelation tends to uh, tends to decay towards zero. Uh, so this uh, autocorrelation is often written instead of writing it as uh, autocorrelation between time t and time s being a function of the distance between t and s. You can often write this just as uh, the covariance at lag s. Um, you know, the covariance between yt and yt minus s. So that's a lag of s. Um, and so there'd be some special cases there. So for example, the covariance uh, at lag zero is just a covariance between a time series and itself, which is just the variance of the time series. Uh, and if you think about that in correlation, that's just going to be a perfect cor correlation of one, a covariance for, you know, the Covariance is just the variance. Uh, in addition to thinking about the, uh, the temporal autocovariance and autocorrelation uh, within a single time series, you can also calculate uh, the cross correlation between two time series. So you could have the relationship between some x at one time and some y at some lag s. Um, that sort of uh, cross correlation calculation could be really useful as an uh, as analysis and exploratory uh, analysis in particular, if you think that X and Y are related to each other, uh, but that there might be some temporal lag uh, between X and Y. So the, you know, the X at this time point is causing a Y at some other time point or Y at some time point is causing the other. You can often uh, sometimes infer a bit of or attempt to infer a bit of causality, you know, because yeah, if one thing's causing the other, it should be happening first, uh, not after. So when we look at uh, autocovariance, you know, it's very common that we, instead of looking at actual covariance, that we look at correlation. Uh, and so here, this row S is going to be the uh, uh, autocovariance at lag s divided the autocovariance at lag zero. So the correlation is just uh, the covariance normalized by the variance. Because remember, the, the autocovariance uh, at lag zero is just the variance in the data set. So again, uh, when s is zero, this is one divided by one by definition, and the autocorrelation is perfect. And then as we move away, that autocorrelation declines. Uh, and we see this in this particular example where the at lag zero, it's a time series is perfectly correlated with itself. And then you know, here at lag one, it has a slightly bit, better than 90% correlation. At lag two, you know, it's in the low 80s, and the lag three, it's the you know, 70s. Uh, and this correlation is declining uh, down towards zero. In this particular case, uh, we're able to put a, a interval estimate on the null model showing that, you know, really, you know, this uh, negative correlation that we see after lag 10 is, is probably just noise. And then in R, you know, uh, 
simple base function for calculating autocorrelation is ACF, the autocorrelation function for some time series X. Uh, also note that this autocorrelation that we're seeing here in a time series concept is the exact same autocorrelation that we uh, explored a, and used a good bit uh, when looking at uh, MCMC output when we we're trying in that case not to understand the dynamics of the system but really just to understand how independent our samples are. So here, you know, in that case, you know, with MCMC, you're trying to understand when the lag goes to zero because then you can kind of treat those samples as independent, uh, and particularly if you wanted to thin things down. Uh, in a time series analysis, you might need to be thinking about needing to account for correlations at lags sh shorter than that. You, know, it's, you wouldn't want to throw out the data, but you'd want to account for uh, that correlation structure more formally. Uh, one thing that could be particularly useful for figuring out uh, how to account for that correlation structure and how many lags you need to include in a model in particular is to rely not just on the autocorrelation function, but the, what's called a partial autocorrelation function, uh, which is a slightly more complicated calculation, but just the gist of it is it's the autocorrelation at lag s after accounting for the correlations and lags up to s minus one. So if we look, this is a, a partial autocorrelation plot of the same time series we were looking at uh, previously. So here, the you know, there's a strong correlation that continued to decline. But if we look at the partial uh, autocorrelation, we see that there's a strong auto partial autocorrelation at lag one, that should be identical to what we saw in this normal autocorrelation. It was in you know, low 90s. But then we see the partial autocorrelation at lag two is essentially zero, saying that uh, there's this autocorrelation in the time series, uh, but that autocorrelation is, does not have memory. So we don't need to take into account a second lag or a third lag or a fourth lag that really all we're seeing is a strong lag at lag one. And because there's a, you know, uh, a strong lag at lag one that causes uh, a strong lag at lag two, not because time two needs to know about time zero, but because time two needs to know about time one, time one needs to know about time zero. Uh, so it's just a, you know, the fact that they're related to each other. If you had seen a strong autocorrelation, uh, at longer lags, that would be pointing to you know, a presence of, of true memory in the system, which is something you'd want to account for, uh, perhaps by including those additional lags uh, in the model. So in addition to our PACF function for partial autocorrelation, there's also a CCF function uh, for calculating course, the cross correlations between two time series function gives two arguments then because you're looking at the correlation between the two. And it's going to you know, similarly explore the, uh, the cross correlation at multiple different lags, which should be useful as an exploratory analysis to understand uh, if you're building a more st structured model, you know what lags to uh, put the relation between x and y. And then again, as we talked about, you might just be using it to understand uh, what if you have two, if you have an x and a y that are correlated, which is uh, leading which and which is lagging. So that kind of wraps up our, our discussion of descriptive approaches. I, I'm not going to go into uh, spectral uh, methods in this course. And so building on these ideas of, of smoothing, detrending, differencing, and autocorrelation, we're going to next dive into how we move into actual writing down actual uh, process models and data models and uh, likelihoods related to uh, that, that include uh, autocorrelated uh, errors.